record. So welcome back everybody. Um, it, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to welcome you this afternoon to the conversation with Peter Block. And um, as, an, as a start to this conversation, we thought it might be a useful, a good idea to just give you a little bit of background around how we got connected with Peter and how it is that Peter's had such a massive influence on so many, many of our lives. So I met Peter in 2008 uh, in San Francisco and invited him to come to South Africa uh, to come and teach us some of the ideas of, that he, in his book, Community, the Structure of Belonging. He said yes, not having a clue what he was saying yes to, and um, came to South Africa in 2009 and then again in 2010. And I thought it might be a good idea for all of you to just get a little snippet of um, what happened uh, in 2009 and 2010. So uh, I'm going to show you a short video clip and we're going to, the video is 10 minutes long, but we're not going to have a full 10 minutes. We're only going to show the first two minutes of this video. So just enjoy this video for a few minutes. Sorry, can you if you are hearing, we can't see you. Yeah. Sorry, what did you say? Could you not, can you not hear what I'm showing? Can you not see the screen? No, no we can't. No. Okay, I'm going to give it one more shot. And if it doesn't work, then we will just not do it. But let's give it one more shot. Okay, can you see it now? Nope. No. no? Okay, I'm not going to play no. it then because for some reason. Are you sharing your screen? I have been. Oh, let's do that. Let's. You are right. I didn't didn't go all the way. So, one more shot. And now it is shared. And now I just want to show you a few minutes. Sorry about that, guys. Is it now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can see it. is about building community and uh, why community is that what we call problems like education health care systems crime are really the symptoms of the breakdown in community so this is really a methodology about restoring community helping people realize that their social fabric is what educates a child it what keeps me healthy a local economy uh, what care for the elderly systems we've delegated to systems the that responsibility so communities have to claim that back the world is changed through invitation an invitation means you can say no most of the culture in the world thinks it's changed through mandate through policy through requirements through somebody at the top deciding what's good for us and then you can decide whether to support that or take a stance but a more powerful version is that the world is shifted through invitation. And a great invitation is one where you can say no to it, and something's required of you, so it has a hurdle, and it's organized around a possibility. The old conversation is that the schools raise the child, the doctors keep me healthy, police keep me safe. That takes us nowhere. So if I want a future South Africa, if I want to create something unique in this nation or any, any nation, then citizens have to stop being consumers and reclaim for themselves the capacity to care for these children, to care for the elderly, to care for the people on the margin, to care. For, and that's a community task. It takes a competent community to raise a child and to heal the wounded. And so this workshop 
is really about giving people the means to do that. And the workshop becomes an example of how that happens. So I don't have to think about it or wait for it. All I have to do is immerse myself today in the future that I have in mind. It's an opportunity to engage with a lot of So that's what happened in 2009. Um, and we did five of these workshops and one of them, uh, Rama attended. So Rama, do you want to share with us a little bit about what happened for you after attending this workshop? Yeah, well, just, just some background. I mean, for, for 10 years before that, I was heading an NGO dealing with civic engagement, uh, just coming out of 150 years of apartheid and battling with the notion of how you start talking about democracy in spaces where people had no voice at all. And so I tried the best I could using the models that I knew until I experienced uh, Peter speaking about the inversion of this power relationship in leaders and community. And it completely changed my outlook on how I turned up in these spaces and the work that needed to get done to create an active citizenry. And, and we took that methodology to the, to the ultimate level because we completely changed the way the organization worked. And for the first time, we weren't teaching people about democracy. We were experiencing what it would be like if we had this democracy alive in every room that we were in. And that completely transformed my life and uh, wherever I turned up and ultimately ended up with me being leaving that job to do this work full time with the Symphonia team and PFP. So the journey continues, but it was life changing for me. And I think for all of us, it's just a matter of, of knowing that there is another way. And this way is not complicated. It's actually quite simplest, simple, uh, simple and based on the that we need each other if we're gonna co-create a future together. Thank you, Rama. So, so Peter came to South Africa, he disrupted all of our lives. He challenged us to, to imagine the possibility of school at the center of community. And as a result of that challenge and many conversations he had, we had when he was here, a million lives have been touched through the Partners for Possibility program and, and around more than 1,350 schools across South Africa. So on the program, as many of you know, we have three training modules. We have time to think, flawless consulting, and then the art of building community. So in the spirit of just connecting back to that conversation in 2008, I'm gonna show you one last clip. And now this time I'll do it right. Uh, and it's a last, just two minute clip of, of that time when Peter was here. So enjoy this. The future gets created uh, out of a possibility, not out of a problem-solving process. In South Africa, you have an amazing story, amazing culture. You're in the process of remaking yourself, and, and the challenge is to create a, a future of your own creation. There are few countries in the world that have a public conversation about forgiveness. And so there's some kind of compassion some kind of longing, some kind of relational capacity in this country that just isn't going to be found anyplace else in the world. The world needs to extract something other than suffering from Africa. And so this process of building connection, community relatedness, possibility, ownership, a gifted based country. This is what the world needs to learn from South Africa. and. Uh, and you have the capacity to do that if you just shift the conversation. Okay, so how did this call come about, the one we're having today? Peter spoke at the Leadership for a Changing World conference recently. I listened to the recording and I asked whether he would be willing to share some of the ideas that he talked about at the time with people in our community. So we're going to spend the next half an hour or so listening to Peter in conversation with Rama and myself. And then we'll have another small group conversation and create an opportunity for, for large group engagement after that. 
So we're going to, Rama and I are going to do our best to create the space that everybody will kind of enjoy. Um, and we're going to also invite you to just share any thoughts that you have in the chat while, um, while we're talking. And then in about half an hour or so, we'll invite you to join the conversation. So um, Rama, over to you. Thanks, Luis. So, so Peter, uh, at this conference for Changing World Conference, you said something that was quite controversial, I think, very relevant for all of us. And you said that we need to rethink leadership. And it made a lot of leaders very jittery, given that COVID-19 had thrown out a lot of the old expectations of leaders. And the question for us now, and you raised it at the conference, is whether we need that leadership at all. And what do we make of leadership given the fact that everything, life as we know it, has changed and we no longer need the experts in the room, but a different role? What would that role look like, according to you, Peter? Anyway, it's, uh, I'm trying to overcome my vanity and look at how young I was in 2009. This is the but I this is the problem with Zoom. It, it doesn't <laughs> lie, but I just try to keep my eyes off myself. You know the uh, COVID in the world and uh, the racial things that were are a pause. To me, everything's been paused. Uh, the children were sent home. All right, the, the, the streets are half empty half the restaurants. And so to me, it's a wonderful time to say, well, so what do we want to create now? We're not going back to anything. Uh, and then the old normal wasn't working that well, except for us maybe. And so I, I like the notion and leadership has always been kind of a collecting pot for our projections and our disappointments with either or both of our parents, even if we didn't have them. And we've expected leaders to be somebody more. And you had an amazing leader, uh, but it's our expectations of leadership that are unfulfillable. Everybody around here, whether it's protesting about race, whether it's talking about the economy or what are we gonna do with schools, they're expecting someone at the top to figure something out. And that's what you're here to invert. When, when Amy says, you know, how are we gonna create something for schools? Well, the first thing you do is you're disappointing a lot of people if you decide that participation in democracy or something you care about. Uh, the other thing about leadership is it's a distinction from management. Management is organized around people's deficiencies. Most kids going to school or learn what they're not good at. And then I keep relearning it most of my life. And the way we organized effort with management, management stands for speed and clarity and certainty and predictability. And here's what you have to do to rise. All those conversations are not very powerful. They don't create an alternative future. Um, and so we're, we're kind of abandoning management. If we still need them managers to give order. So I got to know that there will be a building there when I go to work in the morning. And we do have some intentions, goals, but it's not powerful. But what you're doing together is to say, how do we create a, an alternative future? And the world has conspired with us now. Now we're going to try to just recreate the old one. When can I send my kids back to school? Well, don't you realize that school was not a babysitting service? Now you may be back in the buildings now, but most of them in the States, most of them are not yet back in the buildings. They're trying to get back. But the real crisis was not, are my children learning? The crisis was, what am I gonna do with my kids? And so the notion that Rama said of, you know, that I, that's a great question. Neighborhoods will raise children. And I bet they do for the, in the way that you work. Uh, but the idea of leadership is to say, well, how do I use my position to confront people with their freedom? If you ask me what Louise and Rama have done all these years and you, is you've confronted people with their freedom. Most of the world is not up for that. 
they feed on people's dependency. They say, oh, you want me to be a hero? You want me to be a god? You want me to make eye contact and lean forward and indicate interest? Happy to do it because once I engage in that contract with you, I own you. And in the US, I don't know if you have this language in South Africa, but they have a whole group called talent acquisition, which says, look, if we need new employees, we can go out and buy them. I'm going to acquire a car in the morning. I'm going to acquire a house in the afternoon. And then that evening, I'm going to acquire people. And the, and the contract with acquiring people is that if you do what I say, I'll take care of you. And now that's always been a lie. But now we have an opportunity to reimagine that and say, my job as a leader is to say, well, here's, here's the game we're in. This is a school. This is a business this is a neighborhood association but we together will figure out who we want to become and that process of making people into groups to say well what's the possibility you want to live into what are the gifts and strengths that you have to bring what are the things you said no to uh, or, or said yes to that you want to change your mind What's the no you've been postponing? These are all come down to very simple, powerful questions. But when we answer them with each other, uh, it creates a doorway and an opening for us to say, well, what do I want to do? I want to say yes to. What ways will this use the gifts that I was born with and have developed? Uh, what's the possibility? See, the possibility doesn't have to be defined. It's just something I bring with me wherever I go. And uh, many of you are the possibility of love and the possibility of compassion, and the possibility of justice, the possibility of reconciliation, the possibility of a school where children learn to create a future for themselves. And uh, in declaring the possibility, you bring it into the world. And it's hard to get that because we all want to leave the room with a list. I want to do some problem solving. I'm as a, uh, I keep asking myself, Peter, why are you still leaving meetings with a list? You're 81 years old. And, and you look it. You know, you can't, who are you, who are you kidding? And it's hard to get over that. It's just a bad habit. But these questions and the configuration, the small group, three, four, five, six people in a circle is how our freedom gets expressed. Because there's no place to hide. Uh, I don't even like more than four people. And it's okay if people say, I pass. We just want you here. So I think, you know, the uh, leadership is a, f a process of convening. And I, you know, and wherever you are, every time you're there, break them into small groups so they will find each other. Most of our large gatherings, it's as if people came to find the speaker. Well, if you're the speaker, just say, hi, thank you for inviting me. I always used to say, if you plan to be mo motivated or inspired, you're going to be disappointed. So let's just get that out of the way right now. And, and then you talk a little bit about whatever you're talking about, community, a possibility, gifts. And then you say, I want to break you up into small groups. And they say, I didn't come for that. I came to hear you. I came to hear the... And you said, I know you didn't come to that, but because I care about you, we're going to go into small groups where you can find the people. If you want to find God, you'll find it reflected in the eyes of four other people. You don't need a professional at the head of the church pointing you to God. And so whatever you're up to, and now some people don't want to do it, but it doesn't matter. You, you have a choice as to how you want to construct and bring people together, and especially strangers. The yeah, welcoming of the stranger is the essence of community. It's not a community if we're like-minded. Nothing destroys democracy more than like-mindedness. And so you're always saying, be in a group of people you know the least. And they say, well, I, I, these are my friends. I know they're your friends, but you're never going to be surprised if you just talk with like-minded people. We came here to be surprised. And uh, the nice thing about South Africa 
any illusion anybody ever had about the United States of America being a role model. We've taken care of that. We've solved that problem for you. There's nothing here. There's nobody home here. All right, we're a declining nation. The rise and fall of the Roman Empire. No, the rise and fall. We're not going to make America great again. It never was that great. We began with genocide, for God's sake. Columbus didn't discover America. The Native Americans here, indigenous people, didn't run up to Columbus's ship and say, hooray, we've been discovered, we've been discovered. And so the American thing is, uh, you know, it's, it's sinking. And this election will only determine how fast that is. Now, we're still rich, but we'll get over that too. Most of our development work and generosity was to create markets for our own products. So the word development is imperial all the way. Oh, no, we're, we're going to help these underdeveloped countries, third world countries with contempt. A friend of mine, Gustavo, was Mexican. He said when Truman in 49 said, we came through the war well, we're going to help these undeveloped countries. And he said, we all looked around and said, well, we didn't know we were undeveloped. Wow. And so that in that thinking puts the notion of needs and deficiencies to bed. And we're not going to develop other countries. We can't even develop our own. Uh, and, and so I, you have another opportunity in, in, in the world you've created now. One of the things I loved 10 years ago, meeting in those rooms, was you weren't so damn sophisticated as what I was used to in the United States. You know, in the U.S., our basic stance is we've been there and we did that. I don't care what you said, you know, been there, done that. Oh, yeah, we've heard that before. What's new? What's new? What's new? So that's always a useless question. What's new? It means you're restless, you know. Uh, and so I always felt being with you that there was, you just weren't so sophisticated and cocky and you wanted to see, be with each other. I can see it in your eyes now. You still want to be with each other. And of course, it's frustrating. And, and of course, the leadership will disappoint us. It's designed to disappoint us if it's elected. It's constructed that way. Uh, we should just vote for people and say, I, I'm curious as to how long it's going to be before you disappoint me. Sooner the better, then we can get on with ourselves. We can get on with our lives and get on with each other. And I think it's going to become a neighborhood world. You know, we built this culture, industrial, on speed, got to be fast. Everything's got to be convenient. Uh, everything's got to be taken to scale. These are all the ambitions of small little white boys. Okay, little white supremacists, little white boys. Now, now that many of you are grown up, you're not that way anymore, but that's that kind of notion of, of scale is so slow is going to happen. Neighborhood's going to happen. I'm, I'm choosing to live an inconvenient life. It means I may have to walk somewhere to get something. Uh, it means I may have to find somebody in my neighborhood that's growing something so I can have dinner tonight. Very inconvenient, you know, the, uh, our supermarkets are way too big. And, and so I think where we're headed with this the leadership is uh, you're going to be smart and slow and local and neighborly. And you'll say, well, what neighborhood am I touching? Well, that's the one I'm going to invest and care about, or two neighborhoods, and, and get rid of the notion that we're going to, it's going to be a national movement. I, the race discussion here, and then I'll stop in a minute. It, this bothers me because it asks for too little. Most of the racial conflict is, thinks the police are the problem. You have your own history with that. Most of them think what they need is more diversity training. Are you out of your mind? Do you really think four or five hours of con uh, is going to make a difference with the police? That's just silly. Oh, we need a vice president of inclusion. What are you talking about? We don't need another vice president. Oh, we need some black faces on the board of Ford Foundation. Well, we've had a black face running the Ford Foundation forever. So these, these are all management actions, useless. Useless. What we need is to say we have to build a black economy, period. We have to get rid of the toxic debt that's killing all of us. We have to create housing where people don't get kicked out. And blacks have to own this, run this.
in, in, in this country, African-Americans own almost nothing. The average, I mean, we're still rich of seven, 17,000 a year, is the average asset wealth of a black person here. A white person, $175,000, 10 times. So to me, that conversation has to get into controlling the land, controlling enterprise, getting really fair, get rid of the consumerist debt and assuring some housing owned by us. This is the work of the neighborhood in addition to raising children and being safe. So that's, uh, those are just some thoughts. And Rama mentioned that, you know, your generosity comes in the form of seeing the gifts of people around you. Right now, when we call somebody poor, we treat them as if they're broken. Oh, you poor, how many, how many years of school have you been to? Well, that treats a person like they're stupid. Oh, your neighborhood, do you feel safe in your neighborhood? Well, that treats a person as if they're dangerous. And so stop that conversation. There's no such thing as a poor person that was invented for the economic gain of the social service industrial complex. There's no such thing as a poor, that's not how I am. We love the ho homeless. Everybody wants to talk about everybody. We, we love everybody. Oh, they're homeless. That's not who you are. There's no such thing as a homeless person. I don't go around saying my name is Peter and I'm housed. That's, that's not who I am. And so all this transformation is really linguistic. And that's what you're learning. That's what you learn from each other. You're helping people gain a conversation. As folks know, well, what are you good at? I don't know what I'm good at. Well, can you fix a small engine? Can you walk a dog? Can you pray? Can you be kind to a young person? Can you make an older person a little less lonely, please? Can you garden? Can you sew? Uh, can you tell jokes? Can you smile? Everybody's got gifts and our job is to make that the subject of conversation. Now, what do you want to do with that? What are you willing to teach other people? What do you want to learn from each other? And that's so it becomes a gift focus and using, helping people use language like that. Now, I've talked my 30 minutes and then some. No, not, not quite, Peter. So, um, so, so we've taken this idea seriously. We've been challenging each other to say, what if schools could become places where children can discover what they're good at? We have on this call many people who have been mobilizing community around schools. Schools have, have become the center of community. I want, to, I want to just shift the conversation a little bit to the role of leaders um, in the world, but also specifically in the workplace. And that when, when I, one of the things that really touched me was when you're saying, I think one of the things you said um, is that the job of the leader is to create a workplace where the, yeah. where the team can fall in love with each other. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit more around how, you know, Given COVID, given this reset, given this opportunity to reimagine what the workplace looked like, what are your hopes and dreams and challenges to us as we all grapple with that? Well, I, I'm not sure I have anything very interesting to say. You know, basically, when people say, what's the future going to look like? All you can say now is, I don't know and I'm not going to know. We're not going back to normal what was because normal didn't work very well. So I don't know what we have to do as a team, as a school, as a unit, is decide what kind of future do we want to construct. We want to construct together. And if we don't first fall in love with each other, you know, in this work, you can fall in love with people even though you don't like them. I don't have my neighbors, I don't, I don't like them. There's a couple that irritate me, I irritate them. And every time I go to the grocery store, I'm confronted with my irritation. If this one person is in the produce department, I'll go to meet and hope they go home soon. You don't have, but now, once a month and more so, this person and I are in a meeting together deciding what's good for this neighborhood. I don't care how I feel about her, you know? And so liking, I like my, no, you didn't choose your neighbors but you organize them. You didn't choose the, all the people in your, whoever you're working with. And so put like aside and replace it with love. 
and what you love is something larger than how you feel about that soul. You, you care about us, you care about the safety of our children and each other and the well-being of, of whatever you're touching. And it's minute to minute. You know, you've got a one-hour session, we'll make that, find some way in that one-hour session that people can find each other, be surprised by each other. That's what love is like. And this all came from, a, I don't know if you were there or not, Louise, with Ward. A woman said, uh, I'm a math, I teach math. And, well, how do you do that? She says, I get the children to fall in love with each other in the presence of a math teacher. And I thought, oh my God, changed my life, bingo. Now, am I any good at it? I don't know, I talk too much, but I've been working on that. It's not going well. But, you know, you know, at some point, how do people fall in love with each other? Well, these questions are ways to fall in love. What's the crossroads you're at at this stage of your life? How can I not love you listening to that? And on the opening, I would ask every time, what's the commitment that you are? You got to choose that. I don't, where you were born, how tall you are, out of my hands. What's the commitment that you are? As soon as you answer that question, love has begun. Now I know what you care about. I don't care whether I agree with you. I didn't come here to argue. Uh, for years, I would say to people, I got this from Peter Kestenbaum. If you're going to argue with me, I'm warning you now, I'm going to take your side. So go for it, but I'm not going to argue with you. I didn't come here for that because it doesn't produce anything. It may be fun at night, but it doesn't, argument doesn't produce anything. And so what's, what's the crossroads you're at? Treat you like a choiceful human being. What are your gifts? What do you want to say no to? What's the resentment that you hold that nobody knows about? That is a killer question. You, you get somebody to answer that question and you can't help but fall in love with it. You've been holding that resentment all the years and nobody knows about it. Now I do. Thank you. I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm not going to fix it. What's the forgiveness you're unwilling to let go of? Hmm. I don't have any forgiveness. There's things I can't forgive. That's not true. You can forgive somebody in a minute. So all these questions are tools and you all have 10 more that people get connected emotionally to each other. So when you do talk about a fire hydrant, when you do talk about a school curriculum, the context is one of connection and possibility and relationship. Uh, and Warner says context is decisive. That's what you created. That's what Rama, Louise, and uh, all of you that I knew, see again a little bit, are creating together. And so we talked about in a small group, how you're getting people connected to each other. Now, if you have to masquerade it as skill development, go ahead. Peter Kestenbaum also says all marketing is pornography. And so here's Peter, here's Leah, here's Callie, here's Laura. They're our speaker today and they're gonna teach us some very specific tools. So what, get them in the room, Give them a context and they say, okay, time to do something useful, small groups. Well, I didn't come for that. I know you didn't come for that. Small groups and with strangers, you know, it's hard virtually. I mean, Louise, you can do it with Zoom, but the other last thing I'll say is that uh, engaging people with each other produces energy. Giving talks and having people listen consumes energy and it took me decades to learn when I was giving a talk or talking and the energy was going down maybe I should do something about that and for the first 30 years I decided to talk longer and louder and then finally it dawns on me when the energy is slow soft break them into small groups get out of the way don't sit in a small group and don't facilitate a small group for God's sake it needs your presence. And since sometimes because I'm as lonely as anybody, I'll sit with a small group and try not to say too much. I'm on the verge of talking too much. Rama wants to, say, wants to ask something, but he's muted. I, I've got it. So Peter, uh, let me shift the conversation again. One of your things that you say quite often is this shift from leader, from expert to convener. And uh, given the context, and I know from the work that we're doing in South Africa, 
a lot of leaders battle with the notion of what does it mean when you say leader as convener? And what would you say would be two or three starting points for us to start this journey uh, that is gonna be so fundamentally disruptive of the old, the way we always imagine leadership to be? Well, I would say you have to decide whether you care whether the people that you're leading are accountable for the well-being of what you're trying to do. You can't manage people into accountability. You can't hold them accountable. You can't use grades as a weapon. And so if accountability doesn't mean anything, then lead away. You know, you need some language without being too prescriptive or punishing. I would, I would ask people, well, in terms of the organization you're running, are you getting what you want? And usually they're not. And so then you can say, well, what makes you think trying harder is going to help? And then I know that basically in a small group, people will pull the leader along. And, and some people, and a lot of them are located in my country, could care less about community. You know, I, I would never talk anybody into anything much. And so if people are committed to be God, let them be, bless them and move on. You know, and it's the experience that's persuasive. Even now, this has been, it's nice to be with you, but if you don't get into a small group soon, I won't get fired. And, 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 the, and the idea is that you want every gathering to be an example of its theory. If you're a stance for connection, for love, for community, if you're a stance for having people choose their future in some way, and, uh, and that's what freedom is. Freedom is the capacity to create an alternative future. It's not license and it's not liberty. Liberty means you got rid of an oppressor. Uh, freedom means that somehow you got to grapple with the fact that what are we going to create together that we couldn't do alone? And uh, then people with each other will decide to do that or not. And, uh, it's hard work. You know, I've been We've all been at this a long time. And uh, Mary and a friend asked me, Peter, do you feel that your life has been, you know, useful? I'm, like the end's in sight, future's behind me. It's the beauty of getting old, you know, running out of things to be anxious about other than, you know, all matters family. But, uh, I said, yeah, I think my life's been useful. Do well, you feel you've made a difference? Mm, not exactly. I mean, how many people will any of us ever touch? You know, you just never want to claim victory. So you touched 1.3 million children, that's nice. So what about the other 4 billion? And so, you know, the stance is you do what you do in, in, in every way you can, but don't, I don't know, you just need to, see it for what it is. And then we find places that were worth going to, like you, you know, I didn't know why I was going to South Africa. Louise sandbagged me in between a talk or something, grabbed me and said, you need to come to South Africa. And I don't know, I didn't have it in me to say no to Louise. And you may have the same problem. So we should, maybe we should start, how do we say no to Louise? Small group. But uh, you don't know, but, once in a while, you end up in the right place at the right time with the right people. And you thank God for it. Most of the time you don't. Peter, we're gonna go in, this, in a small group in a minute. Um, and I'm sorry for all those people who have to cope with saying no to Louise. But anyway, we're gonna go into a small group. But just before we do, uh, I remember very clearly the first time you sent all us all into a small group you told us not to be helpful to each other. And you said, Ooh. because being helpful is a modern form of colonialism. So before we go into our small group and, and, and might be tempted to be helpful to each other, just say a little bit more around, why should we not be helpful to each other? Well, these are the protocols 
for the small group. One is go with people you know the least. And the second is don't be helpful. Don't ever say to somebody, you know, when I was in your position, here's what I did, because it pretends that it turned out well. Well, it didn't turn out that well. Look, look at us. You ready to brag? Claim victory. And so it's, it's like developing a third world. I don't know what's best for you. And if I do, I have colonized you. And so instead of helping you, I substitute with a question that says, why does that matter to you? There is no more loving question in the world than for me to somehow find you interesting. And if I come to you to fix you, well, shame on me. That means I got nothing better to do. Say, that's, that's okay. I, I need lots of fixing, but it's not going to happen now. And so you just ask people, why does this matter to you? And when they answer, you do it again. Why does that matter to you? And you keep asking to go deeper until they get irritated with you, and then you stop. Thank you, Peter. And I think it's on that note that we're now going to create another opportunity for people to go into a breakout conversation. And, um, and the question this time is, what struck you about what you've just heard? And then we'll come back and we're going to be in a large group conversation with each other. So you should now all um, ex see your invitation to go to the breakout room. I'm opening the rooms. Enjoy your conversation. It's going to be about eight. 10 minutes in the conversation and then um, we'll invite you to come back into the main room. So Branwell, Branwell, Afsana, and Ridwan, have you all received your invitation to go to a, brand, a breakout room? Afsana, Ridwan, have you all in, received the invitation to go to a breakout room? We're putting you on the spot. Yeah. So, mm. hi, Louise. So, so it seems like we were a little bit distracted with the chat, sort of seeing what people were writing and asking in the chat. So, we don't know what we are doing in this room. It was to, to share with each other what struck you about what you've heard from Peter, what you've heard so oh. far. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Louise. Oh. coming back from their breakout room. So Rama, over to you. Well, you had a, a couple of minutes to talk about all the stuff that we heard from Peter, and it was a lot of stuff. So we just want to ask you one question. What, what struck you about this last conversation that you just had? What struck you about the conversation? And, and let's see what happens in the big group compared to the small group. So if you drop something into the big group, it's because it's an active choice to share with this community a new sense of learning or awareness, not to show how smart you are. So if you have an insight, an idea, something that turned up for you in your small group discussion, please share it with the rest of us. You can unmute yourself. 
So Ra Rama, sorry, Rama, Renee and, um, and Kim have both unmuted. So maybe Renee goes first. Yeah. <clears throat> um, hi all. So um, yeah, I, I think one of the biggest things from, from that conversation for me was modern form of colonialism um, with regarding to helping. Um, for me, it, it sort of, honestly, I, I found myself take a step back um, because I had never looked at it like that. So I believe being helpful, you, uh, my, my opinion of it is that you're helping, but you're actually changing someone else's way of doing something which could create something amazing and not giving them that opportunity to do that um, could be harmful. So yeah, that for me, that very much written it down, um, still in my heart, is, it, it has really knocked me for six. Yeah. Love it. Renee, I love the way you framed it, Renee. And uh, who else do we have? Louise Kim. So then yes. Kim, yeah. Hi. Yeah. So what came up in our group was, um, was the, was the same thing around our desire to help, our desire to help and how flawless and PFPs underpinned by the, by the idea of not being there to be there, but not being there to help, but being there to be a partner, a thinking partner on the journey. And Peter's humbleness, his humanity, the idea that Peter would feel lonely enough to join in a small group. <laughs> it just touches my heart so much. So I'm, I'm loving this. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kim. Pam Anyone Pamela else? was had us all unmuted. Um, uh, so maybe we could go to Kay and then to Pamela. Okay. Uh, thanks, Rama, and thanks, Louise. Um, so ours was a beautiful conversation and I got to know Mark on the call that's from Cape Town. So Mark and I just got to know each other and it was the, the best few minutes so far. It was lovely to connect with somebody in Cape Town while I sit here in Johannesburg and just really, we just spoke about each other and there was curiosity, asked me about me and it was just a beautiful flow of conversation. So thank you. And then Pamela. Um, I, I had a massive insight when, um, Peter was talking about don't be helpful to each other because it's a form of colonialism. My insight was, um, having been a, 50, uh, a physio for 55 years and now a quadriplegic for two and a half years, and um, having people at Kirstenbosch always wanting to help me, um, but it definitely coming from two points of view. One is saying, would you like some help? And the other one um, is saying, Listen, the way I'm, 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 you just have to take my hand because I really know better and there is a better way. And you wouldn't believe that people would say that. Um, but, but it's a predominant sort of, um, it, it's, it happens very often. So instead of saying, um, what do you think I am, deaf, blind and stupid that I can't see that there's a ramp over there, but actually I need the rail to walk with. Um, so I stopped myself and I said, well, who needs a gym when you got Kirsten Bosch? And that's a lovely way to put um, a smile on people's faces and start to make friends. But to the, my big insight was about the colonialism was actually being helpful is the, the, is the, um, the basis of all of the isms. So you take racism and you take ageism and you take ableism and any other one that you care to mention. Um, but actually people wanting to be helpful are, that are saying, I know better than you. Um, helps them, the, 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 if you can help them change their think, thinking away from that idea and into how do we collaborate um, in small groups. Um, you know, collaborate with individuals and in small groups is a great way to go. And that was something I learned from one of the kids that I worked with who, um, uh, well, so that, that's a long story. I'll, I'll tell it to you another time. Um, but, but a six year old said to me, when I was showing photographs to him and his father of what he'd achieved, and I had a couple of nurses from Red Cross sitting there watching um, because they were there to learn about communicating health to children. Um, and he turned it to me and he looked at the photographs, he loved what I was saying, and then he turned to me, looked at the nurses and smiled and said, 
and what about the friends? And that's what we've got to do is collaborate as friends. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Rama. Thank you, Pamela. Everybody who said something. I want to, I want to, because I know how Peter works. He's sitting there and he's got a chewing because he's got a whole bunch of things that's come up for him while we were talking. So, Peter, we'd like to hear your thoughts and reflections in response to what you've just heard, in response to being a small group. Uh, we all wish we could have a whole day with you. We, only, we know we've only got another 10 minutes, so we'd love to hear a bit more from you. You know, I, all of these are complicated. You know, of course you wanna help people. Of course you wanna bring love and, but it's hard to know when I'm being helpful and for whose sake am I doing this? You know, I, my small group of us, two bankers. I thought that was awesome. Because I, I had the notion that if we're going to ever tackle poverty in this world, it's going to be the private sector that's going to do it. And uh, so I want to stay connected to them, Louise. I got their names. I'm not going to tell anybody else. Nina and uh, Anthony. And it's... I think the convenient is a, pot, as a, is a design. It's an action. It's not just in, hey, you want to get together. And the questions make, in the absence of you asking difficult questions, people will just share opinions. And opinions don't take us anywhere. I'm not really interested in your opinion. My country now is killing itself with its opinions, social media and all that kind of stuff. Instead, I want to know what's the crossroads you're at something personal, anxiety provoking, and ambiguous. People say, well, what do you mean by that? And my answer is exactly. And you all get that. I mean, you're changing the world. Uh, and you, you, you can do that intentionally if you believe in a small group of people connecting with each other. And if you believe that when you bring them together, you can give them questions that will get them deeper with and into each other. And uh, people will at some point say, when are we gonna take action? Well, getting connected is an action step. You wanna make a list, make your list. You know, you only write down on your list of things you're afraid you're not gonna remember, which means they weren't that important to start with, but go ahead and make a list. But you have to at some point as I mentioned in a small group, sometimes the best thing I've seen is to offer neighbors a small incentive to make this place better. And I like that language. That way I'm not deciding. I'm not saying like, oh, I'll incentive if you clean up this lot, I'll incentive if you reduce crime, I'll incentive if you go to school with your kid. No, you just offer people an incentive of some kind to just make the place better. And if three of you get together to do it, I'll give you $200. Or the bank or the institution is such a small thing that every private institution can do. And it carries with it the message that uh, you with each other, with some support from the private sector and others, you know, churches and others uh, are the future. If you, if you wonder, if you want some control in these uncertain times, and who knows what COVID is and what it meant, you know, you could, who knows when it's going to be over. And, uh, but you just bring people together uh, and you just invent ways. In my neighborhood, we got a bunch of restaurants who are dying. You know, we got a bunch of people working at the hospital, frontline workers, and we asked people, will you put up money so the restaurants can give free food to the frontline workers and kept the restaurants in business and showed our appreciation for people that were at risk. And, you know, these are all just little devices. They're not anything to take to scale. But I, I just, I don't know, every, the reason I would never say no to Louise or Rama is because they always bring together people that are pretty awfully amazing, you know? And, uh, 
and give enough structure so you can see what you'll be doing. You can't just say, what do you want to do today? You know, and so I'm thrilled to just be part of it. And the colonial thing's such a big deal. You know, as a couple of you said, Renee and Pamela, you know, it's, there's gotta be a way that I can be useful to you without knowing what's best for you. It doesn't mean stop caring, stop loving. It's just that all of our programs and social services are so efficiency based and we get these fancy things. We're gonna end childhood poverty in Cincinnati. I, I, I swore I wasn't going to swear and I'm gonna keep my word, but it doesn't go anywhere. You get a bunch of people who think they know what's best and, and the solutions are always the same. Oh, we need more schooling. So last year we passed a bill to start teaching kids at age four. Schooling doesn't do it. Connection doesn't care. We started a hip hop center here in Cincinnati, which is a no brainer looking at my style. Okay. And we started a hip hop center and we asked the young African-Americans, how many adults have your interest at heart? And most of them coming off the street said none or one. And then the next thing we asked them was, what do you love to do? I said, we love hip hop. We want to make, we want to lay down beats, we want to dance. And so we said, fine, that's all we're going to do here is teach people hip hop how to, and uh, at the end of four months, we would ask them, now how many adults you feel have your well being? in mind and they would say, when they never get to three or four, they would come in off the streets. And uh, we've been doing that 17 years and it's small, and, but it's just a way of thinking and nobody would ever come because in, in, the, in the, the United States, we're terrified of blacks, especially 14 to 24 year olds, you know? And uh, that's who, that's all we worked with was 14 to 24 year olds. And what do you love to do? Good, we'll give you a chance to do. We're not going to play basketball. All right, I'm not going to sit around and watch TV or do video games. You don't do that here. You learn how to write music, to sing music, to engineer music, to lay down beats, to dance, to do graffiti. And we're going to do 200 performances a year for the city. And uh, so the gift focus is just so powerful and radical. And uh, what I like about seeing that video again is I've forgotten that we had music in the room. How do you do transformation without music in the room? And we had plants and live things. Louise worked hard to get that music. And, and she worked hard to make sure there's something living in the room that we inhabited. And so all of those things are you bringing your humanity into a larger world. Can't hear you. Roma, you are muted. <clears throat> yeah. Peter, I've got one last question for you, a bit of change of pace. The, the two big issues that I, I see more and more in our context in South Africa is about uh, resignation and denial. Right. Uh, I, I'm powerless or the problem is not there. And, and maybe you could say a little bit about that uh, uh, when we speak and work with community. Well, that's why the invitation matters. Some people are in denial and there's nothing I can do about that. The world will get to them sooner or later, if not in this life, then the next one. I, I don't make it my business to go after the most difficult, resistant, denying people. Let them go, let them be. You know, and, and the world is always depressing until we fall in love with each other. You know, there's no answer to the world. I don't see it. I mean, it's painful for me to go through this period of my own country's history and see the what's emerging, you know, but if I have you or if I have a little project or something, then I realize I'm not alone because the patriarchy or colonialism will make you think that you're alone. It's up to you. So it's first that you start school, they say it's up to you. Second is, there's something wrong with you. We're going to fix it. And the third is, 
you begin to think you're crazy. I look at the world that I inhabit, that I helped create, and I think, oh my God, what's then I sit down with you. In three minutes, I realize I'm not crazy. You know, that there is, I'm not seeing things that aren't there. Now, if I, if I feel powerless, I've taken on something too big. Take on something small. Something, we, you know, and have people take on something small. That's why the colonial notion of scale and speed and all that stuff is just an argument for making money, whether you're a social service or, or a school. I don't care what size the school is. I don't care what the class size is. But, you know, also, this work takes enormous faith. And you just have to believe that something's possible that's not facing you at the moment. And I don't care what your faith is in. If you're a member of AA or something, you surrender to a higher power, go ahead. I don't care what your higher power is, whether it's God or not God. Atheists, is, nobody cares more about God than an atheist. They'll tell you every second there is no God. Well, that's commitment of a kind. But it takes faith and uh, low expectations and each other. And uh, then that once in a while you do some of the works. Once in a while I went to South Africa. It worked. Uh, I went to most other countries, mostly it didn't work. So, so I go home, try it again, you know, and that's where you need support. And what Louise and Rama are great at is kind of giving everybody some, some place to know they're not alone crazy. And then you decide how depressed you want to be. Uh, Peter, thank what? you. We, we've come to the end of our call and I want to, I want to end this call in a very particular way, which I've not contracted with you, so I'm, I'm jumping this on you. So while, while I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask Peter a question, which is going to maybe be difficult for him to answer, I don't know. In the meantime, I want the rest of you to think about the gifts that you've received from being part of this conversation today. And we are going to ask a few of you to express that um, verbally by saying it and specifically saying it to Peter. Um, but before I do that, I want to ask Peter something. So Peter... I've heard you say many times um, over the last 10 years that we in South Africa have taken your ideas further than many other places and many, many other people. And um, I've been very blessed. Every time I've heard that, I've been quite emotional and it's, but it, and it's meant the world to me. But there are many people on this call who have contributed to make that happen. So I know that it will mean the world to them to hear you say that. Well, uh, you said it, which makes it true, not because I said it, but I, I don't know. I just, the genius of bringing the private sector and making schools the center of community, just that sentence alone changes, is a miracle. And you all in Symphonia together have just found a way to both build partnerships that care about kids and schools. And I just felt there's so much in what you're doing, it was just a genius design that it made a huge difference. They say, we're gonna have one event a year and, and you, the executive, and you, the, the principal, are gonna design it together and then we'll do this training together to help you get ready to do that. Some of that's just genius by design. And I, I would say it again that I, nobody's taken the work of flawless consulting and the six conversations and integrated them in a more powerful way than what you've all done. And uh, of course it's not enough, but it's a lot. And I, I just, uh, I'm so glad to know about it. You know, most things you don't find out, but uh, it's just been a wonderful relationship and it was nice to be with you this morning, you know, just reminds me of 
how powerful you are and how open to relationships you are. And that's a miracle. And then I met two bankers, I'm gonna do something. What the hell? Maybe I'll borrow money from them. What the hell? Not exactly, but all right, I'll be quiet. You've got two minutes. Thank, thank you, Peter. And now I want to invite anybody on this call who want to, maybe we'll just hear from three or four people who want to say what it meant for you to be part of this conversation. What are the gifts that you've received this afternoon? And Liz has already unmuted herself. So Liz, over to you. Hi, Louise. Thanks so much. And Peter, thank you so much for giving us your time. I think this afternoon, the conversation is a reminder for me of all the learning that happened during my partner year. And the point is it may start with the school as the center of learning, but every single person who is exposed to the learning every single person has changed. Every single person goes back into their own community, their own workspace, their family, the things away from those schools that we're engaged with and the ripple effect into every single space you touch is so profound. If you can just keep on holding on to those central core concepts. And that for me is what's so powerful is just being reminded again to get out of my own way, to really listen to find out what people's gifts are and and to be of service. Um, I just love it. It's been so, so incredibly useful for me. And I'm in a new country about to start a new job with so much opportunity. And it's so powerful to be able to bring this all with me. So thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. I was hoping that we would hear from one of the school <laughs> principals and Loretta Lochrenberg has just unmuted herself. So Loretta, you've been a school principal on this program. You've been touched and inspired by yeah. this afternoon. Just thoughts um, from you. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, it's really a privilege to be part of this session, especially hello to Peter. It is a privilege to be part of this. And I just want to say to Louise and to Rauma, uh, for their initiative, they changed lives. And I want to say that really this session was just a reminder of what we are still doing. And I know that Louise, uh, they visited my school and we are still working in our community. So I just want to say to Peter, you must know that your work is, is just growing and we are working in our communities at the moment. We are changing that community where I I am, and um, as a leader, uh, Louise and her team equip me so that I can have a vision to go to another community where we can continue this work. So I salute you for the hard work that you've put in. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Loretta. So now we, I have to, we just going to tell you the last people that will speak. So we're going to, we're going to hear from Letta. Um, Greg Grunmeyer, Christine, and then we'll end with some words from the Mupumalanga Nal Sprite group, um, large group. So Letta, then Greg, then Christine, and then Nal Sprite. Yeah. Yo, I gotta go. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, Louise, once again for inviting me to meet Peter after 10 years. I know. I feel really, you know, it's awesome, Peter, to see you. But I must let you know that in the religious life, whenever I'm asked to come and help a community or a congregation like that, I'm always quoting you. And they keep on asking me, where can we get the books? So Louise, please let me know where those books can be got because just the name community, the structure of belonging speaks million for me. And when I say it to people, I say it with that conviction that it can make a difference in our lives. And I've been now a superior general, Peter, for six years. And I wasn't like, you know, I was always asking questions to try to move people with me to say, what kind of a future do we want to create? How do we want our congregation to be sustainable? You know, how, what commitment can you bring into the space. So those are the kinds of questions that you have in that book that I often keep on using in different conversations. So thank you ever so much. And I'm really happy to have seen you again today. Thank you. Thank you, Letta. Peter, are you able to stay for three more minutes or do you need to go? I need to go. Okay. 
So thank you, Peter. But, we, but you, you, you can stay together. We will stay together. We, we what have I'll do to is I'll, I'll, leave my, I'll leave my thing on. Anyway, thank you so much, all of you, and the thoughts in the chat are really touching. But I'm thank going to- Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. So, so anybody else wanted to just say something? I know Greg wants to say, even if, you, if you're not able to say it to Peter himself, just Greg and then Christine and then I'll spray it and then I'll, Ram and I will end. Greg? Thanks, yeah, thanks Louise. Um, well, I just wanted to express my gratitude for, to Peter for just the years of being exposed to his work and how much it's influenced me. And I just want to acknowledge to him that we've used it in a corporate context and uh, in a very useful and effective way. And, uh, and today, just the whole concept of falling in love with each other just goes so against the spirit of what we see today in the corporate environments. And it's really challenged me in terms of, so how do we blend that into the weave we call the corporate world at the moment? So, and yeah, just so thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. It was great to be in the room with him. So thanks. Thank you, Greg. And I just want to say, if anybody wanted to get a message to Peter, put it in the chat. I will, I will get the chat um, to him. So you're welcome to just do that now. Christine Manyaka. Uh, thank you, Louise. Thanks for this opportunity. I'd just like to thank um, a legend, you know, a remarkable person, uh, Peter Block. What I've learned, uh, the few minutes I've, 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 I've joined in. Uh, for me, it's like everything that we build around us, it, it is very key, especially to our values, the values of quality, the values of inclusion, the values of partnership, and sustainability of whatever that we have built together. Thank you so much. I've learned a lot. I've learned from the comments, and I'm so happy to listen to him. Uh, I wish this kind of 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 uh, um a meeting or a webinar should be, uh, you know, be a continuous, um, and to be continuous so as we learn from, from, from the remarkable people. We learn from the people who are experienced in education, who are experienced in life, who are experienced in building the community, who are experienced in developing good citizens of different countries. Thank you so much, Peter Block. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Louis and the team. Thank you, Christine. Um, I do. No. I, I, I want to ask you all to stay for two minutes because I've got some really something really interesting to tell you. But let's quickly go to Nell Spread, and then I'm going to tell you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Christine. Sure. I'm on. Hi, uh, I'm Walter Thornhill. I'm an attendee by default, and I wish uh, I'd known of Peter Block's work before. All I can say. Is today has been a most refreshing tonic, not only for myself, but a gift of remembering if we're going to be true leaders and conveners, that we need to be that humble to tease out and explore the gift, the curious gifts of our fellow citizens. Thank you, Peter Block. Thank you for your work. And lovely to meet you all. From Mapumalanga. <laughs> So thank you very much for Mupumalanga. Um, I want to just end by, by letting you all know that um, after a lot of cajoling, we have got, Peter has said yes to doing a series of, of six conversation masterclasses with us. Um, I've got a special price for South African delegates, $100 rather than $300. If you are interested and want to be part of this, um, please let me know urgently because we've only got 25 places, so, but I, I might be able to negotiate a few more. So drop me an email. You've got my, you've got my details because um, uh, the, the tickets have just opened and I'm afraid they're going to fly like hotcakes. It will start on the 30th of November, um, three Mondays this side of, of the end of the year and then three Mondays in January. So with that, um, a big thank you to Rama for disrupting your afternoon this afternoon to be with us. Thank you to the Mpumalanga team to make that possible. Thank you for everybody who joined us today. A big thank you, obviously, to Peter for spending this time. Um, I'm hoping we can create another opportunity somewhere in the future. It will all depend on the messages in the chat and the feedback that we get. Um, but thank you very much, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. And it was a real pleasure. And I know my heart is completely 
overflowing after today. Um, I hope you are also energized. Thanks, Louise. We are really. Bye, bye. everyone. Thank you. Bye. Love you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Louise, thank you very much. We bye really bye. appreciate it. And we're definitely energized. We really appreciate it. Bye. Thanks to everyone.